You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary. To the sweetest girl I know. Hello, everyone, and welcome to History of the Great War, Episode 64. This week, I would like to thank Benedict and Scott for subscribing to the show's Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash history of the great war. Subscribers help keep this show going, and they get access to special subscriber only episodes. So head on over to Patreon and check it out. This week sees the release of our third premium episode, which dives into some what if scenarios of when the war might have started if it didn't happen in 1914, and what might have changed. It was quite a bit of fun to create and hopefully to listen to. Last episode, we looked at what Falkenhayn's mindset was going into 1916, why he planned on attacking in the West, and his overall strategic goals. We also looked at the Allied plans and how the upcoming action at Verdun would greatly disrupt them. This week, we're going to dive much deeper into the German plans for the attack at Verdun. The attack would be planned for two phases. The first was the attack at Verdun, and then the second was a counterattack to an expected British or French relief offensive. We will also talk about why on earth the Germans would attack Verdun, and more importantly, the geography and fortifications around Verdun, which made it such an imposing target for an army in 1916 to try and attack, let alone to capture. This is just the second part of our 13-part series on Verdun, so hopefully you have listened to part one last week and you are in this for the long haul. Verdun was an old town. It had been founded by the Gauls back in ancient history, and it had been the site of many battles over the millennia. In the centuries before the war, the French had put a lot of time and money into defending the area, and the creation of the fortifications that were present in 1916 started in 1870 and the Franco-Prussian War. During that war, it had been besieged by the Prussian invaders, but it had held out longer than any other fortification in France. After the war, the French took stock of their frontier fortifications and decided to drastically improve them, and Verdun was one of the sites that would have the most work completed. This period of fortification, at its height when the French strategy for the war was highly defensive, would not be as well known as that of a few generations later in the creation of the Maginot Line, but it would still be a huge undertaking. Over the period between the Franco-Prussian War and the First World War, there were 500 forts and 278 prepared and protected artillery emplacements constructed. The largest of the forts were designed to withstand sieges of days or weeks, but they were not designed to hold out indefinitely. The general idea is that they would present enough of a problem for attackers that they would then be funneled into specific invasion corridors where the French army would be prepared to meet them in battle. In fact, contrary to what you might expect, some relatively easy invasion routes were left unguarded specifically to funnel armies down them. This was at a time before the First World War, when it was proven that an army could, with enough men, fortify all of France. So the French just wanted to know where the Germans would go, not necessarily stop them from going anywhere. The geography of the region around Verdun greatly assisted in the goal of creating some sticky obstacles for enemy armies. There were concentric ridges all around Verdun that in themselves acted like natural walls. On these ridges would be placed the fortresses and other smaller fortifications. The construction of these fortifications was at its peak soon after the Franco-Prussian War ended, but it would continue all the way up into 1914. By the start of the war, there were 20 major and 40 intermediary forts on the map of Verdun. Some of these would become famous, like Douaumont and Vaux, but others would also play a role in the fighting. All of these fortifications were placed so that they could fire upon the attackers of the other fortifications in the line. But all of the fortifications were not built at once. It took decades. And during that time, artillery would increase in capability. So the new forts would be better than the old forts, and they ha- these old ones had to be updated. This meant that when the war came, especially after several years of the French military being under the strong influence of offensive-minded generals, there were some forts that were far more capable than others, and at the top of that list was Douaumont. It was the largest and strongest of any fort at Verdun, and it was located 10 kilometers northeast of the city, and it also was at an elevation of 1,200 feet. 
The fact that it would change hands twice with very little fighting is quite the irony. So much time and money had been spent on making it so powerful. How these fortifications were built and how they were protected ends up being pretty important during the actions at Verdun, and the most important aspect was that they were mostly underground. These were not medieval castles. In 1914, the fortresses had so much concrete and earth on top of them that the only thing visible were the gun turrets. This method of having concrete and then a layer of earth and debris and then more concrete would prove to be very successful against even the heaviest of the German guns. This also meant that there was a labyrinth of corridors and storage rooms and barracks underground, which would be the scene of fighting during the action at Verdun. These were usually lit by electric lights, which were often the first to go during an attack, so many of these actions were in the pitch-black darkness underground. The attackers navigating through a maze of twists and turns, which were of course never the same from fort to fort, and always closely guarded by defenders who were just trying to survive. One of the problems that the architects at the time were trying to solve was how do you allow the fort to still have guns without them compromising the integrity of the fort's defenses? This was important because the forts were designed with the primary goal of being protected stationary gun platforms and as artillery observation points, so you couldn't just completely bury them underground. But the only way for guns to fire out of the forts was to put holes in all of that concrete that was just poured to try and defend from enemy artillery. The solution to this problem was the French landed on the retractable steel gun turret. The turret had a hard steel covering that would protect it when under fire and when it was retracted. When the gun was retracted, this was the only part visible from the surface. When it was time for the gun to fire, the turret could then be raised and the gun fired and reloaded, or lowered again if the enemy started firing. This was a great solution, but it was not perfect. Turrets were complicated, expensive, and most importantly heavy and this meant that they could only be so large. Another problem was that to raise and lower the turrets, the guns had to completely fit within them. The barrels couldn't stick out at all. Put these two problems together, and you end up with the result that the guns that went into these turrets could not be normal size. They had to be modified. So the 75mm and 155mm guns in the turrets had their barrels shortened to allow them to fit within, which were as, and these turrets were already as large as they could be. This meant that the gun's ranges were greatly reduced, but at the time this was not seen as a huge drawback. When the forts were constructed, the only weapons that could threaten the fortifications were siege mortars, which had a very low range. This meant that as long as the guns in the fort outranged these mortars, they were more than acceptable. This would not be the case by 1916, of course, but by that point it was too late to try and do anything different, and the guns would have to stay as they were. When war came to Verdun in 1914, the French Third Army had been able to hold off a number of German attacks. The city had almost been surrounded, but this was barely stopped, and it resulted in Verdun being at the end of a narrow and deep salient, pointing out into the German lines. By the end of 1914 and then 1915, the strategic importance of the area had decreased greatly, as fighting had moved elsewhere, and the terrain was not conducive to the type of breakthrough offensives that the French were hunting for at the time. The Germans had launched a few attacks during 1915, but most of these were small to try and pinch off the Verdun salient, but they had not been very successful, and they were actually considered failures. By 1916, the town itself was mostly empty, with 80% of the population having left in the first year and a half of the war. However, this did not mean that it was a dead city. In fact, there were many new businesses in town that had been created to meet the needs of the French soldiers stationed around the town. This meant that there were actually more grocers and restaurants in Verdun than there had been when the war started. Before 1916, the French soldiers even considered Verdun to be a nice, quiet sector where they could relax in relative safety. So with this de-emphasis on the French side, it can and probably should be asked why Verdun was chosen by Falkenhayn as the point for beginning his grand offensive. As I mentioned before, Verdun was not a great spot for a decisive breakthrough, or a great offensive victory. The geography almost entirely ruled this out, even without all the pre-built defenses. In fact, once the offensive really got going, Joffre and the French leadership were initially more than willing to retreat behind the town. In some ways, that would have drastically improved the French situation. There were ridges and hills behind Verdun that were easily defendable, and they would not have been surrounded on three sides by German artillery. 
But the civilian leadership stepped in, and they had serious concerns about abandoning the city. Verdun was pretty well known in France. It was not just some random hill in the eastern part of France. It was probably in the top five list of places in terms of the name recognition within France with the population. Because of this, the government could not allow Joffre to give up the city without a fight. If that happened, the government would probably have been overthrown and another one brought in to replace them. Falkenhayn was counting on this reaction from the French. He sort of built his entire plan around it. There were some positives on the German side for attacking the sector. It had been largely quiet, and this meant that the French defenses, other than those big forts of course, were not the best engineered or manned. With the French soldiers considering it an easy rotation point in the line, the defenses in the area, outside of the front line, could be described with the word greatly neglected. And then there was the fact that it was a salient pointing out into the German lines, which allowed for three-sided artillery attacks to be launched. There would be nowhere for the French soldiers to hide, compacted down into their small little area surrounded by enemies. It was also an easy win for Falkenhayn with the Kaiser, because it would be none other than his son, the Crown Prince, who would lead the German 5th Army in the attack. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com gw50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. After Falkenhayn had obtained the Kaiser's permission for the attack, the planning began in earnest during discussions between Falkenhayn, the Crown Prince, and his Chief of Staff, General Noblesdorf. These began in December. The relationship between the Crown Prince and Noblesdorf, who was technically his subordinate, was an interesting one. Noblesdorf had been the Crown Prince's military tutor earlier in life and therefore exercised a huge amount of power within the German Fifth Army. It was because of this relationship that Noblesdorf has gotten the job in the first place. He was well liked by the Kaiser, and he had been seen as a way to give protection for his son, who did not have a great amount of command experience. As the situation at Verdun would progress, it would become very clear who was actually leading the Fifth Army, and it was not the Crown Prince. The Crown Prince was initially excited for the role that his troops would play in the upcoming attack. When he learned of the 5th Army's role, he would say, quote, My long-suppressed eagerness to lead my tried and trusted troops once more into battle against the enemy was now to be gratified. I was filled with happy anticipations, yet I could not regard the future with a confidence altogether serene. I was disquieted by the constantly repeated expression used by the chief of the general staff of the f that the French army must be blood white at Verdun and by a doubt as to whether the fortress could, after all, be taken by such means. End quote. In that quote is one of the most interesting nuggets about the Verdun campaign, at least in the opening phases. Falkenhayn did not believe that the capture of the actual city of Verdun was necessary for the offensive to be successful. On the other hand, the Crown Prince and Noblesdorf were aiming to take the city right from the very start, and that is what they based all of their planning around in the run-up to February 21st. Part of this misunderstanding was due to the fact that Falkenhayn was not precisely clear on what he wanted. It would only be later that the Crown Prince would learn of Falkenhayn's true purpose for the attacks, as he referenced in the previous quote. 
While there is this and other disagreements between the Crown Prince and Falkenheim, the one thing that everybody could agree on was that the artillery should be at the forefront of any fighting. Heavy artillery would plow the road, and the infantry would just walk down it. The first draft of the orders began with the words, quote, The decision to take the fortress of Verdun in an expeditious manner rests on the proven ability of the heavy and heaviest artillery, end quote. Which is extremely unambiguous. The French would be constricted down into their little salient, and the German heavy artillery would blast them away. The problems and disagreements all came into play when the discussion switched to what would happen after the artillery began firing. When the initial plan was given to Falkenhayn by the 5th Army, it envisioned a quick advance on the east bank. But it also called for an advance on the west bank. Just a little aside here, I will try to be consistent here, but if you do any other reading, you will see that the area on either side of the River Meuse, referred to by the east and west bank or left and right bank, generally one source will pick one or the other. For future reference, east equals right and west equals left. I just want to make that clear because it can be a bit confusing. The discussion between whether to attack on one bank or both banks would be the primary port of contention between Falkenhayn and the Crown Prince over the course of the planning for the offensive. All of the simulations and planning for before the war insisted that it was absolutely essential to attack on both banks of the river for an attack to have any hope of success. In fact, every simulation done before the war showed any attack on just one bank to be a complete failure. So this knowledge is where Noblesdorf and the Crown Prince started their planning, but Falkenhayn was adamant that it was possible to achieve the goals of the attack by only attacking on the east bank of the river. His primary reason was that he did not have the number of forces necessary to attack on both sides. The reason for this was that he was holding back troops to take part in phase two of his plan. The fear of the generals on the scene was that if they did not attack on both sides, the French artillery on the west bank would prove a serious problem for any advances on the other side. In its position, it could rain down fire on any German advances on the east bank. The pre-war thinking was that the only way to neutralize this threat was through an infantry advance, but Falkenheim believed that the French guns could be silenced with only the use of German artillery. This decision, this very first decision in the detailed planning, would haunt the Germans for the rest of the year. The next decision, and again something that Falkenhayn and the Crown Prince disagreed upon, was on the objectives of the opening phase of the battle, and what they should be. Falkenhayn wanted limited objectives to keep the cost of the advance as light as possible, a slow and methodical movement that was constantly waiting for the artillery to clear the path. On the other hand, the 5th Army wanted to strike hard and fast and advance as far as possible after the initial bombardment had ceased. Here again looms the problems of the objectives of the 5th Army and of Falkenhayn being out of sync. Even the wording of the orders given, of written orders, were in conflict. Falkenhayn orders said, an offensive in the Meuse area in the direction of Verdun. And the Crown Princes said, to capture the fortress of Verdun by precipitate methods. It does not take a military historian to see how these might be interpreted differently. However, when the orders of the 5th Army, which would now only attack on one side of the river, were submitted to Falkenhayn, with those words in them, he approved them. But why would he do that? He knew that the orders were not properly conveying his purpose. This was another very important decision that Falkenhayn made in the run-up to the battle, and another mistake. It is also one of the big moments that those who dispute the Christmas letter point to as proof of their assertion. If his goal was never to take the city, then why would he approve orders that, that had that as their stated goal? One of the possible reasons that Falkenhayn would have approved the orders, and this might be a little bit of a stretch, was the impact that it would have on the morale of the German troops. It is a valid reason. Soldiers like it when their goals are to capture things like the strongest fortress city in France, that's a goal worth fighting for. A goal of wearing out the enemy, maybe slightly less inspiring. The German troops had been on the defensive so long, and if they were just going to take another part in a battle of attrition, which they had been fighting defensively for months, it was not going to give the men the boost that the generals like to see in troops before an attack. Falkenhayn also believed that, even though the 5th Army's orders disagreed with his own, he could still control the course of the fighting. 
through his position and his ability to control the flow, or lack of flow, of reinforcements to Verdun. At any point, if he wanted the attack to go faster, he could give it more troops. If he wanted the attack to slow down, he could hold those troops back. Or at least that was the theory. The criticism of Falkenhayn during this stage of the planning is near universal, from what I've read, even from historians who generally paint him in a pretty positive light. No matter what his goals were for the attack, it was clear that the 5th Army was not on the same page, and as the commander of the situation, it is absolutely his responsibility to make sure that they were on that same page. This has caused hyperbolic quotes from historians in books about Verdun, like this one from the excellent Price of Glory. Quote, Seldom in the history of war can the commander of a great army have been so cynically deceived as the German crown prince by Falkenhayn, end quote. As I said, pretty hyperbolic, but it's not a stretch to say that Falkenhayn failed. But the orders were approved on January 27th and published to the 5th Army. The attack would happen, whatever its goals, and it was scheduled for February 12th. During December and January, Falkenhayn was not just concerned with the attack at Verdun. He had bigger plans, and these bigger plans were Phase 2 of the offensive for 1916. Phase 2 would start with the actions of the enemy, more specifically with a French and or British attack. By threatening Verdun, Falkenhayn was convinced that the French would launch a premature attack somewhere else to relieve the pressure. These would of course fail, like every other French attack, and then Falkenhayn could just send in the reserves to mop up the pieces. Falkenhayn believed that the attack would come in one of two places, and stop me if you've heard of these before, Artois and Champagne. If the attack came in Artois, the goal would probably once again be to capture Vimy Ridge, and because of this, Falkenhayn reached out to the 6th Army to discuss the plan for the counterattack. The 6th Army's commander, General Kuhl, did not play along with Falkenhayn, at least not precisely. The first draft of his attack involved 12 army corps, a force way, way larger than what Falkenhayn had in mind. He was thinking more like eight divisions, not eight corps, eight divisions. When Kuhl then scaled down his attack for these numbers, the result was a plan that aimed to capture some small pieces of Vimy Ridge that had been lost to the French. That was it and this did not meet the grandiose goals that Falkenhayn had when they were requested. Falkenhayn thought that Cole should be planning a grand offensive against a broken set of French troops who had attacked too early, and this is where the prime misunderstanding lay between Cole and Falkenhayn. Cole did not believe the fundamental premise of Falkenhayn's plans, that the French would attack prematurely and without proper preparations. He believed that they would wait, hold the line as best as they could at Verdun, while preparing for their counterstroke. This difference of opinion, even after many discussions, which continued for several months, was never rectified. Even after the British started taking over part of the line in front of Kuhl, Falkenhayn did not give up on this idea. In fact, the two generals would never come to an agreement. But it would not matter, in the end, with the course of Verdun and the attack at the Somme. The other possible option for the French was an attack in Champagne, and for this option, Falkenhayn contacted the Third Army. He found them not much more agreeable to his plans than Kuhl had been. They presented two conditions they believed would have to be met before any attack could be launched in Champagne. The first condition was that the location of the advance had to present an obvious tactical advantage, and the second was that there had to be an obvious way to take this tactical advantage and roll it into larger gains. If these two conditions could not be met, then it was not worth the time, according to the Third Army. There was only one place on the line where both of these conditions could be met, and that location would need a lot of additional work in digging jumping off trenches to bring the lines closer together before an attack could be launched. They also projected that they would need only six divisions for the initial attack, a number that Falkenhayn was a big fan of. However, for the follow-on attacks, they believed they would need at least an additional ten divisions, for a total of 16 additional divisions. This is where they lost Falkenheim, who wrote back and said that he was refusing this plan and demanding that one be provided that would use only a total of 8 divisions. According to the German strategy and the path to Verdun, the response of the Third Army does not survive the war. However, there is some evidence that the plan drastically reduced the goals of the attack to match the reduction of troops available. 
After this response, Falkenhayn seems to have dropped the idea of the attacks in Champagne. So instead, he went back to the 6th Army in Kuhl in March to see if the situation had changed. Kuhl did not believe it had. In fact, when Falkenhayn arrived in person at Kuhl's headquarters, the 6th Army's commander was confused as to why he was there, and they gave him a plan to capture Arras, now being covered by British instead of French troops. Falkenhayn gave provisional go-ahead for the attack, but said that the troops may not be available depending on the action at Verdun. By the end of March, Falkenhayn had given up the hope of the failed of a failed French attack, which would open the door to a successful counterattack. Just a few weeks later, the Second Army started to report massive increases in British activity on their front. The sum was coming. Looking at Falkenhayn's plan for Phase 2, it is so interesting to look at the juxtaposition between what he had right and wrong about the situation in 1916. He was correct in seeing that a great breakthrough offensive was not possible in an initial German attack, which led him to attacking at Verdun. But his beliefs in the ability of his troops to counterattack, with such small numbers and such grandiose aims, seems completely out of touch with reality. They can only be explained by Falkenhayn believing that the French were so close to the end of their rope that they would just fall apart after their failed offensive. Which is interesting, because that's exactly what the French and British thought of the Germans in 1916. It's funny how that works sometimes. The source of the week this week is German strategy and the path to Verdun, Eric von Falkenhayn and the development of attrition, 1870-1816, by Robert T. Foley. Last week, the source of the week was very approachable, the price of glory. This week, our source is far less approachable. This book is packed with great information and does a great job of analyzing that information. It also ends up reading more like a doctoral dissertation than a work designed for everybody to read. This fact makes it perfect for me as a source, but may not be the best choice for kicking back on the couch for a bit of light reading. The decision made by Falkenhayn in late 1915 and early 1916 changed the course of the war. Understanding why he made these decisions and his failure of properly communicating them is important to understand why the attack at Verdun became such a debacle. The book covers all of these decisions and all of these moments that when they went wrong. Next week, we will continue our look at German preparations for the upcoming attack by stepping one step closer to the front to look at exactly how the 5th Army planned to launch its attack. <laughs>